<laughs> Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> Good job. No, no, I got this. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to me. I'm glad to be here. Ken, Jenny, thank you for inviting me. Um, Ken Renner, you put on an amazing event with great, great speakers. Are you guys having a good time? Yeah. We're having a lot of fun. We've learned a lot. I have some tough acts to follow, following Ken Renner and Justin Renner and Don, but I'll give it my best. So what I want to talk about today is how to attain victory in business. You've heard a lot of speakers talk about obtaining success. Have you heard anybody talking about obtaining victory? And do you know the difference? So what does that mean? How do you obtain victory and success? Does anybody have any idea what that means? Anybody? That's why you're here. So before we get started and I tell you how to obtain victory, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my background. Because a lot of people, you know, I've sold hundreds of, I've sold over 300 franchises and several hundred businesses. And people ask me all the time, Michelle, how did you get into this industry? I didn't start out in this industry. I actually went to nursing school because my passion is people. I have two passions, people and writing. I love people and I love to help people. So it was only natural that I went to nursing school at the age of 17. Very young, I wanted to be a nurse, I wanted to be a surgical nurse, and then I wanted to eventually be a physician. My parents didn't have the money to send me to school, so I also worked while I went to school. So here I am in an operating room, standing on a stool at 4 a.m., looking over to doctors who are about to perform a cesarean. I've never seen one before, so I was really excited. So I'm a short girl when I'm not wearing six inch heels. So here I am standing on the stool looking over the doctors and they began to cut the patient open. Then they take this tool that I think they call the rib spreader and they spread the incision open. Now don't worry, I'm not gonna get gross on you because that's the last thing I remember. <laughs> then my very next memory was waking up on a cold floor in an operating room with people hovering over me asking me, Michelle, are you okay? Are you okay? How can I be okay? I'm on a floor in an operating room. How can I possibly be okay? It was at that point I said to myself, Michelle, nursing is not for you. <laughs> Even my prefer pro professor said, Michelle, you really need to rethink your career. I'm like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> so I need to rethink my career. So guess what I did? I went from, I love people. I wanted to help people. So I went from fixing people to fixing their businesses. So that's what I did. Now, I did gravitate, to, you know, just to fast forward real quick. Um, I ended up in franchise sales, franchise developing, and franchise consulting. Before that, I worked at a big company called Xerox. Has anybody heard of them? And I was a regional manager at Xerox, managing 80 unruly salespeople. You know, salespeople can be very unruly and difficult to manage. But I always had a burning desire for entrepreneurship. That's my other passion, people, entrepreneurship, and writing. And so I started looking for businesses, and I stumbled across this little business um, that had two franchise locations, and I decided to, to purchase a franchise from them. But they wouldn't sell me one. They said, no, Michelle, we know of your record, and we know at Xerox, you're the closer. Because I was the closer. If you couldn't close a deal at Xerox, you called me. So they said, we want you to partner with us. They wanted me to be their partner, to grow their brand. So I said, hmm, let's think. I'm going to leave a six-figure position, making great money. I was young at the time. And can you guys hear me? Yeah. So you want me to take my jacket off? <laughs> okay, can you guys hear me? Is that better? Okay. Is that better? Okay. So anyway, so is that better? Much better? Should I start from the beginning? <laughs> Y'all heard my gory story? Okay. So anyway, I'm at, so I say to them, listen, I'm not quite comfortable leaving my six-figure position with great benefits for a company that has two locations. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll work for, I'll, I'll come, you know, we'll, we'll sign the contract. If this works out, 
we'll partner and I'll work with you on the weekends and evenings and I'll keep my day job. I made more money in six months than I did in the entire year at Xerox. So I decided to leave Xerox. Now you think my friends and my colleagues and my support system will be going, great decision. That's a wonderful decision, right? Wrong. What are you doing? You're crazy. That's stupid. Nobody leaves a six-figure position. Nobody leaves all those great benefits. Well, I do. And those people that told me that, where do you think they are today? <laughs> How much money do you think they're making today? So anyway, since I, I, you know, for that company, I've sold over 300 franchises and I've owned several businesses. I've also sold hundreds of businesses. And I've been the CEO of Capital Business Solutions, Better Business Brokers, and many other companies. I also have interest in a company in South Africa as well. And we, Ken and I have a new um, business and I'm gonna talk about here in a little while. So I've owned and operated several businesses. I've sold hundreds and hundreds of businesses and helped hundreds of business owners fix their business, increase their revenue stream, improve their customer base, and sell their business for more than it's worth, okay? I've helped buyers from all walks of life buy the American dream, create financial freedom, and obtain a better quality of life. I've also franch my, franchised my company, and I have other offices throughout the United States, and I teach individuals how to do what I do and how to become really good at selling businesses. My, you know, when I was a little girl, I wasn't your typical little girl. Most little girls play with dolls. I was walking around with a notebook and a pen and asking everybody a million different questions and writing their answers down in a notebook. And my mom always thought or hoped I would be the next Barbara Walters. Well, I didn't turn out to be Barbara Walters, but I did turn out to be best-selling author for Sell Your Business for More Than It's Worth and Think and Grow Rich. And my next book coming out is called Quit Your Job, Buy a Business. And we also have a TV and a radio show coming out called It's Your Business. So Entrepreneur of the Year, Board of Directors, um, and then winner of the Call Award. I have been featured on MSBC, Inc., uh, Forbes, ABC, and CBS. I also write um, for New Orleans Magazine. Now I'm from, I was born in California, lived in Texas, now I'm in Louisiana, but I do sell businesses all over. And, you know, in life, your network equals your what? Your net worth. If you want to be rich, hang out with? If you want to be poor, hang out with? Poor people. Well, I've had the pleasure of meeting and hanging out with Donald Trump and Eric Trump, and a percentage of the proceeds for Sell Your Business for More Than It's Worth will be donated to the Eric Trump Foundation and Care of St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. I've also had the pleasure of hanging out with Rudy Giuliani and um, Michael Eisner of Disney, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back, and Donna Karen, Arsidio Hall. My best, my, my proudest accomplishment of all is adopting my daughter from a Russian orphanage. And her name was Maria when I brought her to the U.S. at 14 months. And I named her Arabella because Arabella means God's answered prayer. So this is my best accomplishment. So let's talk about how to attain victory in business because nobody could answer the question. So how do you do that? Victory versus success. Most businesses fell in the first five years. Can you guys hear me okay? Am I moving too much? Most businesses fell in the first five years. Would y'all agree? All right. Those that don't fail are generally considered successful by default. And only those that are truly successful on top are victorious. So how do you obtain that? Well, there's two steps. Step one is to plan your exit strategy. How many of you in here actually own a business? Okay, that's all in the whole room? How many of you actually own, the, own a business? Can take it off. 
How many of you actually own a business? Okay. Is that better? <laughs> How many of you have planned your exit strategy? Two hands. Three hands. Okay, so you guys have planned your exit strategy? Okay, good. That's usually two more hands than I see go up in an audience. Well, excellent. So step one is to plan your exit strategy. And there's three ways to exit. You can exit by passing a business on to your children. Do you really think that's doable these days? Yes. In some cases. In some cases. But I've been selling businesses for 15 years and very seldom has it happened. But it is doable, absolutely. So you can pass it on. Then the next step is you can sell it or this is what happens many times is you can go out of business because people run out of money, people get burned out, health issues, divorce, legal issues, etc. So obviously the best choice is either to pass it on to your children and or to sell your business. But here's the deal. You have to build something that somebody's going to want. You have to build something that buyers are going to want to pay for. You have to build a business that's going to be attracted to hundreds of buyers willing to pay you top dollar for your business. And how do you do that? You know, because there's plenty of people that run businesses, start businesses, and fail in businesses. Would you guys agree? Very few people actually sell businesses. Selling a business is the hallmark of success and your legacy. You know, people respect success, but they truly admire and envy winners. Jack Welch, General Electric, wrote the book Winning. Have any of you read that? Okay. To sell a business, you obviously need to partner with the right broker, but you need to build to sell. Let's talk about the statistics. Did you know that 60% of sellers who attempt to sell their own business fail? 60%. The sellers end up spending a lot more time, energy, and money trying to sell their own business. And many business brokers also have a 60% failure rate. My firm closes 98% of all offers we write. 98. And we obtain an average of a 20 to 40% higher selling price. The top five mistakes that business owners make is number one, they don't plan their exit strategy. But in many cases, business owners have created a job and not a business. How many of you actually feel like you have a business versus a job? Okay, good. So that's, you know, that's the biggest thing I see in my industry is that business owners are working on their business and not so much, I'm sorry, they're working in their business and not on their business. Owners do not properly brand themselves and their business and owners do not build their business to sell. And like I said, the number one is owners do not plan their exit strategy. So you guys don't have to, um, I can send you some of these slides too if you would like some of them. The top 10 mistakes that owners make when trying to sell their business is first and foremost, they tell people they're selling. You know, selling a business needs to be remain confidential. Why is that? Because people don't like change. No. Sellers, sellers get spooked and think the new owners, I'm sorry, employees get spooked and think the new owner's gonna come in and terminate them and Customers get spooked and think the new owner's not going to provide the same level of service. But guess who likes to shout it from the rooftop that so-and-so is selling their business? The competitors. The competitors like to say, oh, Mr. Ricky is going out of business. They don't like to say Mr. Ricky is selling. They like to say he's going out of business. All right, so confidentiality is huge and you have to be very careful. And then many business owners wait too long to sell their business that we just spoke about. They wait till a catastrophic event has occurred. You know, partnership uh, disputes, divorce, health issues, etc. The best time to sell your business is when your business is doing well and your business is going up, not turning downward. And then um, they also, I know there's real estate agents in here, but they also hire a real estate agent to sell their business. Most real estate agents do not know how to sell businesses. So incorrectly pricing the business, most, would you be surprised if I tell you that most business owners underprice their business or overprice their business? They all overprice their business. They all think their business is worth more than it's worth, right? They all do. 
How many of you are parents? How many of you think your kids are the most beautiful kids on the planet? Everybody. So how many of you own businesses think your businesses are the best? Same thing. My, the hardest job of what I do is to tell a parent that their business is not as pretty as they think it is. Okay? That's one of the hardest jobs. And then neglect, neglecting the qualified buyers. This is huge. Most business owners don't qualify buyers. They give away all types of proprietary information without ever qualifying the buyer. And then focusing on only one buyer. We don't do that. I'm selling a $15 million oil company right now. I've already bought the owner three LOIs. We're under contract as we speak. I have backup LOIs. Why do I have backup LOIs? LOI is a letter of intent. Why do I have backup LOIs? Because people pull out. Yes, people pull out. You know, I'm never going to stop selling. I work for my seller and I'm going to make sure that um, we sell the, their business in case the buyer backs up. And then attempting to sell to employees. It's very difficult. It's a slippery slope when you try to sell to employees. And if you're going to do so, you need to hire a professional to help you. What's the number one reason sellers hire business brokers? First and foremost is confidentiality. So the benefits that we offer is confidentiality. We fix the business before we sell the business, and we help owners build to sell, and we properly evaluate the businesses. There's so many different misconceptions out there of how businesses are evaluated. And then we facilitate the selling process and we keep the players focused. There's a lot of players in selling a business. In this one deal I'm working on, this $15 million deal, guess how many attorneys there are? No idea? There's like, there's six attorneys on the buy side. There's three attorneys on the sell side. There's five CPAs on the buy side and two on the sell side. So we keep players focused. Okay. When I sell businesses, there's obviously deal killers. Number one, time and professionals. Attorneys, are there any attorneys in the room? Thank God. <laughs> attorneys can be deal killers as well. And I have a team of people, I've been doing this for a very long time, so I have a team of attorneys, I have a team of CPAs, I have a team of tax specialists, and I control the players. The more control we have, the more we're able to close deals, and that's why we're able to close 98% of everything we write. This is the many steps in selling a business. First and foremost, we have to evaluate the business to see what the business is worth. And then we have to package the business for sale, and then we have to market the business, and we have to qualify the buyers, and then we have to start the negotiation process, and we go back and forth, and we have to write up the offers, and then we have to go through due diligence. This due diligence I'm in right now is about 90 days, okay? So it just depends. Now, I personally only sell businesses a million and up. I sell all kinds of different um, categories of businesses. I do a lot in the oil industry, manufacturing, distribution, um, service businesses as well. So what do you think the biggest issue is facing business owners? Most are not sellable. Did you know, well let me ask you, out of 10 businesses, how many do you think that actually sell? Say there's 10 businesses up for sale, how many do you think will sell on average? She got it right. Two, only two. Only two. <laughs> it wasn't intuition. So two will sell. Guess what? That's a big problem. Eight out of 10 businesses will not sell. Baby boomers, there's millions of baby boomers planning their exit strategy and attempting to sell their business. But many of them will not be successful and will have to leave their business, close their business, or sell for pennies on the dollar, or give it away, basically. So this is a huge issue, and this is why I work with a lot of, of people to help fix their business. So when you, what you really need to do is build a business that's going to be attracted to hundreds of buyers. But what do you need to do? Is you need to decide where you want to end up at. What is your end game? 
What is your desired result? You know, I always tell my clients, let's follow the GPS model. When you want to go somewhere, you don't pull out the big floppy map anymore. You take your GPS, you plug in what your desired result is, and it calculates the quickest route to get you to your destination, correct? All right, well, same thing with selling businesses. You need to know where you currently are. Know what your business is worth today. How many of you actually know what your business is worth right now? Nobody? You know what your business is worth? Well, you just need to leave the room. <laughs> you got it all figured out. Well, if you can't sell it, it's zero. Right? <laughs> if you, well, you not necessarily. We won't talk about that. So you need to know what your business is worth today. Know your end game and reverse engineer it. So know your end game and reverse engineer it. What do you want to sell your business for? If you want to sell for $20 million, then that's our goal. And we need to reverse engineer how we're going to get to $20 million. All right, so all of you should text, and I got permission for this, by the way. <laughs> all of you should text 475-9701 and text the word VALUE for a free complimentary business evaluation. Okay, that's 504-475-9701. Type the word VALUE for a free complimentary business evaluation. All right, so build your business to sell and plan your exit strategy. Here's a client I'm currently working with. I'm gonna give you a, a story, a real life example. So this is an advertising agency. He's been in business for many years. His end game is to sell his business for $15 million. His current value today is $5 million. Now, here's something you really have to focus on, and this has been the re reoccurring theme of the entire conference. What is your why? What is your purpose? Many speakers have spoke about your why. Why do you want to be in business? Why do you want to sell your business for $20 million? What is your why? Because if your why is not strong enough, then you'll never do the work necessary to get you to that end game. So you really have to determine what your why is. With my buyers, I always make sure we know what their why is because if we don't, they'll never pull the trigger. They'll listen to all the negative voices in their head. They'll listen to all the external negative voices telling them, don't do the deal, just like everybody told me, don't leave Xerox, that's stupid. So the why has to be great enough to pull the trigger. So his why is his wife has a debilitating skin disease. And there's no cure for it. So he wants to sell his business in three to five years for $15 million. We're working on increasing his adjusted EBITDA. Does everybody know what EBITDA is? Okay, his adjusted EBITDA to $2.8 million. So what's the plan? Plan is I'm partnering him with another advertising agency that's not a competitor, that's actually doing very well. They're both doing well. And they're not a competitor, but they have different skills. And they have different niche, niches. Um, and a different customer base. The benefit is along the way, while we're trying to increase that $50 million sales price, obviously we're going to increase revenues. Obviously, we're going to add congruent revenue streams and expand his client base. So he's going to make more money along the way as well. And I'm also partnering with him. Okay. He shared his life plan. Somebody said yesterday, when you, make, when you write down your goals, you need to let people know. You need to share it, but share it with the right people. The people that are going to encourage you, not discourage you. Results, his business will sell for 15 million in three to five years, and he will obviously help his wife. So you gotta know your why, and know what buyers want. Build your business to be attracted to hundreds of buyers, willing to pay you top dollar. So how to build a sell? You need to create the highest value. I know what my clients want. I have over 6,000 buyers in my database right now with money to burn and money to spend on good businesses. But my buyers want a business that has high profits 
They want potential, although we'll talk about potential, and assets and automation, okay? So let's talk about build yourself for profits. You need, you know, it's surprising to me how many times I go in and meet with a client, they have no idea what their customer acquisition cost is. Do you guys know what your client acquisition, acquisition cost is? Yes? So you need to know that. You need to maximize leads, prospects, and conversions. You know, a lot of people might have a lot of leads coming in, but their conversion rate is really poor. And then all possible revenue streams established and minimize expenses. Now, potential matters because my buyers will not buy a business without potential, but they're not going to pay for it. And the ones that will pay for it won't pay much. People are paying for existing cash flow, but they're not going to buy a business without potential. If you're in a dying industry, they're not going to buy your business. Okay? So build or sell assets. Hard assets, real estate, equipment, we put a value on that. Soft assets, this is a lot of times overlooked. Intellectual property, patents. One of the reasons we're selling this oil company for $15 million is because we have three patents in place. So I can get a lot of money for patents, trademarks, contracts in place, and database. Automation. Buyers don't want to buy a job. They really don't. So they want the business to be automated. They want to make sure there's systems in process. And I work with my clients um, all the time to develop systems. And they want to create a business um, that works for, you know, obviously you want to create a business that works for you rather than you working on it. I work on the business, not in the business. The most overlooked thing in a business valuation, and most business brokers don't know how to properly evaluate businesses, is the intellectual property. There's a big value on them. 60 Minutes did a special, and that's why Facebook paid billions for Instagram and WhatsApp. So maximize profits, realize untamed potential, and focus on growing your database and automating. There's a lot of ways that you can make money on your database. I have thousands and thousands of people in my database, buyers, sellers, opportunity seekers, et cetera. And I joint venture with other people and share databases. Do this and you will achieve victory. This is how I sell, this is partially how I sell businesses 20 to 40% more than their worth. And I create bidding wars. I create bidding wars on our businesses. So if you want a free chapter in my book, Think and Go Rich Today, you can text 434-5444, same number. So this is how I work with clients. I work with clients two ways. I do a current evaluation and help clients sell and go. Some businesses are sellable and some businesses, and some businesses are in a position where the money that we generate is enough for them to move into the next phase of their life. Some are not. So then what I do is I'll work with my clients to, to determine what is their current valuation, what is their desired sales price, and then I will reverse engineer it, create a three-year projections, and then create a plan in order to get them there to help them hold, grow, then sell and go. Does that make sense? So I either work with my clients to sell their business or I work with my clients to partner with them to grow their business to get it to the desired sales price. What's needed to get there? And, well, you know, to, to, to sell your business, I get paid when we're successful. If I'm not successful, you don't pay me. There's, um, if you're going to grow your company, obviously there could be an investment there. You know, there's consulting, there's coaching. Um, Harvard did a study, let me go back to that. Harvard did a study that was published, eight studies published in Harvard, Business Review, that showed the businesses that hire coaches had a seven time return on investment. And they were much more successful than CEOs who did not get coaching, which is amazing to me that so many CEOs do not get coaching. That's a rideable moment. Could you repeat <laughs> that statistic again? <laughs> you want me to repeat that? Yeah. There's eight studies, and I can send it to you. If you want to just um, text me at that number or email me, I can send you the study. Okay. And 
but again, there's eight studies in Harvard that, that proves that CEOs that went through coaching got seven times ROI on their investment. Okay. There's two different types of coaches. You have your detached interest, which are 99% of consultants, and then you have your attached, which is my interest, is aligned with yours. My goal is not to grow my client's profits, not just to grow their profits. I mean, obviously we want to do that, but also to build value and to build worth via assets and automations and to sell their business for more than their worth. When I work with my clients, I'm helping them to build a business that I already have buyers in the database willing to pay them money for. Okay? So this is how it works. I assess businesses and their current state and value, future potential, and industry. I look at the industry to see if it's on the way out or on the way up. And then the role that the business owner plays in the business. You know, if, if, it's, if it's a job and not a business, I may not uh, work with them. Then we'll get to work. So what do we do? First and foremost, when you started your company, did you identify your prospect list? Did you identify who you want your prospects to be? Your customer list? Who your best demographics are? Yes? Okay. Well, it's the same thing with selling a business. You need to know who your buyer is going to be. At the end of the day, who are you going to sell your company to? Right? It's the same thing when you went into business. You need to identify your market. So there's five types of buyers. First time buyers are 90%. 90% of buyers are first time buyers. Now, many of these buyers are leaving corporate America like I did. Some of them have money, some of them don't. A lot of them will not pull the trigger unless the wire is powerful enough. But there are also a lot of CEOs, CFOs, and CEOs leaving. So first time buyers are good. Turnaround specialists, those are people that go in and buy non um, producing, you know, not underperforming businesses, turn them around to sell them for a profit. And then you have your sophisticated buyers. And these are buyers that own multiple businesses. They typically pull the trigger pretty quickly, they know what they're looking for, and they typically, typically go to brokers in order to get the good businesses. And then my favorite is the private equity firms. My company works with over 3,000 private equity firms. Do you know what private equity firms are? Like is that like what? No. Does anybody know what private equity firms are? Ken? Okay, so private equity firms are buyers with deep pockets. Money burning a hole in their pockets and they buy on platforms. And there's um, private equity firms, like I'm working with one right now to buy my oil company. That's all they buy oil businesses. I got another one that's all they buy is manufacturing plants. But they typically will not look at businesses unless the adjusted EBITDA is at least three million dollars and up. Okay? So I have 3,000 of these private equity firms that are contacting me on a regular basis saying, Michelle, what do you have? What do you have? And I also meet with them twice a year. Okay? So if you really want to build your business to sell for millions, that would be a buyer you might want to target. And then you have the strategic buyers. The strategic buyers are buying a business to add a concurrent revenue stream, to add talent, to add something to their existing business that they currently don't have. And they too pull the trigger pretty quickly. I have a publishing company buying a printing company because they need to print their books. All right, so which buyer is for you, which buyer is perfect for your business? So buyers are willing to pay top dollar for well-established businesses. The longer you've been in business, typically the higher multiple will be able to obtain for your business. Brown loyalty, automation, databases, and congruent revenue streams. This is what buyers want. And high profit margins. It doesn't mean anything if your business grosses $20 million and at the end of the day, you're making $100,000 a year. Nobody wants that business. Okay, there's some serious issues with that business and that's when Ken and I come in and fix it. So, high profit margins. 
when people, when buyers walk in and evaluate a business, they look at the three P's. People, product, and process. They want to make sure you have the right team. They want to know if the product has a niche or any intellectual property and a process, if the process is efficient, if there's anything proprietary. So these are the things that everybody looks at. And most businesses don't have all three. We work with our clients to work on their company culture documents. And you'd be surprised, this $15 million oil company I'm selling, do you think they have a mission and a vision statement? Do you think they do? Yeah. They don't. Do you think they have a customer experience um, or a company culture card? They don't. They don't even have an operations manual or an employee handbook or a training manual. They don't have any of that. But guess what they have? They have over $3 million of EBITDA and they have three patents and they have no competition and they have contracts. That makes their business valuable. So I work with my clients. You know, the, the one thing I always ask my clients, is your business based on location loyalty or brand loyalty? Do your customers come to you because you have a convenient location? Or do they go out of their way to purchase your products and services because your brand is so good? And if it's based on location loyalty, then you have a problem. You need to work on building your brand. There's five different elements of branding. 95% of businesses live in brand absence. 95% live in brand absence. So you gotta go from brand absence to brand awareness, meaning at least the public is aware of who you are and what you do. And then you go from brand preference. Brand preference is, I prefer to drink Coke. Brand insistence is, I will only drink Coke. How many times have you heard somebody walk up to the bar and say, I have a crown of Pepsi? How many times? Doesn't happen. Brand advocacy is when you say, have a Coke. The more branded you are, money will come to you in droves and the more your company will sell for. Okay, don't you think Apple will sell for a lot of money? What about Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola's brand alone, this is a writable moment, Coca-Cola's brand alone is worth a million dollars. I mean a billion dollars. A billion dollars. And that's not taking into consideration inventory, assets, cash flow, just the brand is worth a billion dollars. So if you wanna sell your business for millions, and or billions, build your brand. And it's important that you brand yourself and your company because many people fail into the fact that they only brand themselves and or their company. You need to brand both because if you're only branding yourself, when you go to sell the business, you're gonna have an issue. Okay, there's a lot of people that name the business after themselves, after their last name. And then when I go to sell the business, it's an issue. And if you look at Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs did a very good job of branding himself and Apple, right? If he didn't, it would have been detrimental to Apple upon him leaving, dying. So also control your online presence and social branding. You have to control your online presence and social branding. I, there's a reason I go by Michelle Seiler Tucker. Michelle Tucker would be so much easier. Why do you think I go by Michelle Seiler Tucker? Because if you Google Michelle Tucker, are there any kids in the room? <laughs> You're going to get 10 pages of porn. Because Michelle Tucker is a porn star. That's why I go by Michelle Seiler Tucker, because no matter how good you are at SEO, it's hard to rise above porn. All right, so you need to control your online branding. You need to know what you look like online. All right, so let's talk about industries on the way out. You know, Blockbuster was the king in its time, wasn't it? It's not anymore. Blockbuster's out because Blockbuster did not innovate. Blockbuster did not predict what's gonna happen in 
So those are the industries on the way out. These are the industries on the way up. And these are the industries that are doing very, very well right now. So when I work with my clients, I want to make sure that their industry is not dying, that it's thriving. And if it is dying, we're going to add some concurrent revenue streams or partner with some other companies. And I want to make sure that they have intellectual property in place. I want to make sure they have their trademarks, their patents, um, any contracts in place. And if you have contracts, make sure they're transferable. If they're not transferable, you'll have an issue when you go to sell your business. Because those customers don't have to transfer to the new owner if, they, if the contracts don't have the language in there. And guess what? It'll come out during due diligence and the deal will fall apart. So know what percentage of customers make up what percentage of your business. You know, we know that it's the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the revenue comes from 20% of your customers, right? Okay. But I have customers that have all the revenue tied up with three to five customers. We know what we do in that instance? We expand our customer base really quickly. All right, so we also, make, like I said, make sure contracts are in place. And we want to make sure we expand the footprint. Remember, my background is franchise development, franchise consulting, and franchise growth. So we want to expand our customer's footprint throughout the United States. And we want to make sure our systems and technology is up to speed. I sold a, a welding company. And a welding company had been in business for 20 years, or maybe longer than that. Everything was on paper. They didn't have any computers. Their inventory was on paper. Their contacts were in Rolodex. So heaven forbid there's a fire because they lose everything. So guess what I had to do? I had to bring in an expert to automate everything and we had to take that price for that expert off the selling price. Okay, so I always look at my client's business to make sure that their speeds and technology are up to date. And then we have to evaluate the special skill sets needed in that business. Because the one thing I wanna do is I wanna make sure I duplicate those owners so that when we sell the business, the owners don't have to stay. Okay, in some cases they do. So here's the financial documents that we need. I need to look at all the financials. Tax returns, P&Ls, balance sheets, AR reports, copy of leases. Buyers will not buy businesses without evaluating all these documents. And when you look at, you know, there's 27.9 million businesses in the United States. 99.7 of them are small businesses. 100% of business owners run personal expenses through their business. Now you know you have your normal cars, travels, meals, entertainment, right? We all do it. But I've seen everything. I've seen child support being ran through the business. I've seen planes, airplanes being ran through the business. I've seen mistresses being ran through the business. You name it, I've seen it. So <clears throat> I'll tell you a quick story to illustrate this. I had a truck and car accessory store that called me up to sell the business and they said, Michelle, I know you and I know you're the best in the industry and if I'm going to sell my business, I'm going to use you to sell it. But I need a million dollars for my business. Can you sell it for a million dollars, yes or no? And this is before I could even sit down. And I said, I don't know. I don't know if I can sell it for a million. Let me see your tax returns. He asked me the tax returns. One year he was losing 85, um, he was losing $8,500 another year he was making $65,000. So I ask you, based on those tax returns, can I sell this business, yes or no? Not based on those tax returns. So it took me six months to go through all of his books and records. And when I was done at the end of my extensive audit, he wasn't losing $8,500 a year. He was making over $400 a year, $400,000 a year. I sold his business in 30 days to the first buyer I sold it to. When the buyer came to the closing table, my seller had to agree to take 50% down and 50% seller financing because banks are not going to touch that deal because of his financial records. So the buyer comes to the closing table, pops a, a briefcase on my table, opens it up, and has $600,000 in cash. He didn't tell me he was bringing cash to the closing table. So they took him all afternoon to count it, and my seller says, Michelle, how am I going to carry this out? Do you have a bag? 
So I don't know, I'll look around the office. So I looked around the office for a bag. Guess what bag I found? I only had one bag in the office. Guess what bag it was? Guess what bag it was? What's the worst bag a man can walk out of your office with? Victoria's Secret. So I, I walked to back and I said, here's a bag. He goes, I can't walk out with that bag. And I go, well, then you can leave the money here. So he says, no. So he walks out. So next time you see a man walking around with a Victoria's Secret bag, you might want to knock him over the head. So I was able to sell his business, but we weren't able to get it financed. All right, when I look at evaluating businesses, you know, I have sellers walk in my office all the time and they tell me, well, my CPA told me I could get 10 times quotes. Fine, here's the phone, call your CPA, tell them to buy your business because nobody's paying 10 times quotes. There's a lot of misconceptions out there of what a business is worth and how businesses are evaluated. And we look at a, diff a lot of different formulas, some are percentage of growth, some are multiple of SDE, EBITDA, but we also take into consideration the intellectual property. We also take into consideration the contracts, the patents, and everything else. So at the end of the day, somebody shouted out earlier, the price is what somebody's willing to pay, right? I, you can come up with a price, I can come up with a price. On average, I'm usually 20 to 40% higher on what I'm able to obtain. But at the end of the day, the price has to meet the buyer's sanity check. So all buyers, whether they're a private equity firm with money burning a hole in their pocket, or if they're a strategic buyer or a first-time buyer, they all ask themselves five basic questions. They all go through the buyer sanity check. Does anybody know what that is? Okay, the buyer sanity check. Number one, how much do I have to put down? Number two, will the cash flow of the business support the debt service? Number three, how much is left for me to live on? And number four, how soon can I get my return on initial investment? And number five, does the business have potential to grow? So when we price a business, I always back into it to make sure it does meet the buyer sanity check. So again, you need to plan your end game. Eight out of 10 businesses do not sell. I hope you wrote that down. Eight out of 10 businesses do not sell. You need to build a business that buyers want to buy. Otherwise, you're gonna end up a sad statistic. Determine a sales price, determine your buyer, and obtain your current evaluation and then your desired sales price in reverse and generic. And then most importantly, know your why. So this is a company, do you see Ken in the picture? This is a company that called me up and um, Steve Burke was very desperate. He said, Michelle, I wanna sell my business. This is a 10 minute phone call. And I said, well, why do you want to sell? And he goes, because I'm going to business as far as I possibly can. I don't have the business acumen to go up to the next level. My wife and I are working 12 to 16 hours a day. We're tired. And I can't, it's either closing it or selling it. There's another option. The other option is to hold, go, then sell and go. Because here's the deal. His current value was about 400 to 500 if it sold. That's not enough money for them to retire on. That's not enough money for them to do much of anything on after they pay taxes and after they pay off their debt. So what we did is we partnered with them and um, we, we, Ken hired employees. I brought Ken Jennings in. This company is in Houston. Ken is here in, in um, Austin. So I brought Ken in to partner with me and Ken's hired employees Right away, I think we have, what, four or five new employees. I rented a 5,500 square foot building because they were working in the garage behind their house. So we're on track to grow this company by five times in 90 days. Five times in 90 days, and our goal is to grow to $15 million in five years. Now, if I would have just, if, it, if they would have got my agent on the phone or talked to any other broker, that broker would have sold, you know, tried to sell their business and they would have been in a much worse position. This way, they continue to do what they love, they have the passion for it, they're gonna make a lot of money over the next five years, and we're gonna sell it for millions. So, you know, everybody always says the devil's in the detail. I 
had a dental company that came to me that wanted me to sell their business for $2 million. And I kept saying to the owner, I, I can't sell for $2 million. It's not worth $2 million. He's like, but Michelle, I'm making all this money. Well, your tax returns is $176,000, and I've been through all your books and records. Where is it? He goes, I'll bring you proof on Monday. So I said, okay. So him and his team, he had a staff of about, I don't know, six guys with him. They came up a flight of stairs, jumped, dumped a bunch of shoe boxes on my conference table. And he goes, here's your proof. And those shoe boxes were what? Receipts and checks made out to cash. So I didn't sell his business for $2 million. I sold it for 2.5. So everybody says the devil's in the details. I say the devil, the details are in the shoe box. Right. Here's a client's business I sold that was um, on the market for only three months. And you, this, this is straight from them. We bought them a contract for more money than what the business was listed for. I can give you testimonies like that all day long. We bought them more money than what the business was, was um, listed for. And then here's another company I sold that was very difficult to sell because of where it was located. We bought them more money than what it was listed for as well. And we sold it to a buyer who said he would never, ever, ever buy a catering company. So I'm always looking for a few good businesses to partner, grow, and sell for millions. And if you uh, know of anybody that wants to grow their business and or sell their business, text the word to 475-9701-GROW. And thank you for having me.